we have been in a discussion <coughs> talking about how we can have hope by leaving the past behind and embarking on this fresh start that God wants us to have. We saw in Ephesians 4, verses 17 through 21, that the Apostle Paul tells us our problems begin in our way of thinking. They begin in the mind. They are corrupted, uh, futile, and, and darkened. And what he uses then is a picture for us. And the picture is that we need to put off these old clothes, have a different way of thinking about those old clothes, renewing the mind, and putting on new clothes that are made in the likeness and the image of God in true righteousness and holiness. And then the rest of this chapter is a description then of these old clothes being turned in for new clothes. And this morning we're going to be talking about deceptive, angry clothes. And I think it's important before we start looking at these three verses this morning, that just to give a framework of what Paul is going to do, that we would not read this paragraph and think, well, here's what Paul is doing. Here's now the big to-do list. So here's all the things you need to do. Sometimes that can be our approach to uh, New Testament teachings. Do this and don't do that. But I want us to observe two things that we will see not only in this lesson, but the next two lessons that we will have as we round out this chapter. First of all, I want us to see that when Paul gives us this description, it's not do and do not, but simply a, a, a replacement. The, the, here, these are the old clothes that are troubling you. If you want to break free from your sins and break free from this past and really move forward in hope, then identify these old clothes as the problem and be willing to set them aside for the new clothes. The second picture is just as important, is that he's going to give a reason for each change. He doesn't just simply say put off and put on, but he will give an explanation. Here's why this will change your life, and here's why it's so important. So observe those as we go through this, and he doesn't just say do something, but he speaks of what gets taken away, what puts on, and why you do that. We'll begin in verse 25, where he will speak here of putting away all falsehood. And so we begin with deceptive clothes, and that the former way of life, the, the old clothes, the old way that we used to live, was in lying, deceiving, being false, being shady about the truth. That, as he says, was the old lifestyle that's supposed to be put away. And as I think about this for a minute, I would like for you to consider within yourself, why do we choose to be deceptive sometimes? What's underneath our line? Why do we choose to do that? And I will submit to you that the vast majority of times that we choose to be deceptive is because we're trying to avoid negative consequences. They're usually trying to get out of something. Something is going to go badly if we tell the truth, if we are honest. And so we choose to deceive to avoid whatever consequences or whatever outcome or whatever negative thing is going to happen. I think that would be the most common answer. And the reason why I think it's important for us to identify that cause is because it really does show us why this cannot be part of the new self, why it can't be the new clothing, because ultimately what we see is that being deceptive and lying is selfish. The reason you're doing it is to avoid something that's going to happen to you. It's a selfish decision. It's not self-sacrificing. It's not self-giving. It is choosing to think about self ahead of other people. I am choosing to protect myself and whatever bad thing may come versus doing what is right and good or what is in the best interest of the other person. And as you think about that, that ultimately gives us the, the, the problem is that lying and deception is selfishness and that we would think of it that way. When we are choosing to deceive, when we are choosing to lie, what we are ultimately doing is being selfish. We are choosing ourselves. We are doing what is in our own best interest, and this is why it is a sin. In fact, 
you see that laid out in verse 25 when he says, here's why I want you to put away falsehood. Don't deceive, don't lie. The reasoning is that we are members of one another. That's an interesting explanation. Would you have thought it was going to be a different explanation? Don't lie because God hates liars. So you go find that passage. <laughs> but that's not what he says. He says because we're members of one another, that we are interconnected. As much as we continue to try in our culture to not be connected to each other and to be completely independent, at the end of the day, if the Apostle Paul says we need each other, we're social beings, we're connected together, and especially true amongst the people of God, that we are members of one another, and therefore we do not lie, we do not deceive, we do not have falsehood, because ultimately those things hurt other people. And I want you to just take a minute and think about it like this, that perhaps some of your greatest pains and your greatest hurts in life have come from people deceiving you. That people lied to you. People that you trusted. People that you thought were on your side. People that were close to you. They lied to you, or they deceived you, or had some kind of falsehood that was going on before you. That's what we need to see, is that this is sometimes the greatest pain, is that lying and deceiving, those kinds of things, is we're inflicting some of the greatest pains upon other people. Because when you think about it, when we are deceiving each other and lying, we're protecting self, we are being selfish, we're not revealing the truth, we're hurting other people and ultimately destroying a relationship, destroying confidence in the relationship. Think about how many marriages are broken and damaged because there's deception. How many friendships are broken because trust has been broken. Friendships are ruined. The church can be wrecked because everybody is being selfish. They are not truthful and all this, but deceptive. Relationships weaken and even disintegrate under the weight of deception. And that's what verse 25 is saying. You put off deception because it's destructive. If we're going to move forward in hope and have these new clothes and have a new life, then please think about, here's something to consider. The lying and deception and falsehood is what's wrecking relationships. It's what's hurting you with other people. And it needs to be put completely away from us. To sum it up like this, God's not deceptive, is he? And neither are his children supposed to be. It's as simple as that. If we're truly his, and we're going to be made in the image of God, and we're going to represent him, he does not lie, he does not deceive, but there is nothing false within him. And we're to be like him. And we are to represent that. And not think about ourselves first, but instead speak the truth, be honest, be forthcoming, and not represent those old forms. And I want you to notice that he puts right here with it, because I think these two things go together well. That's why I didn't separate them <clears throat> into two separate lessons. Because I want you to notice in verse 26, he then just goes right into... And I want you to be angry and do not sin. And I want to leave the majority of our time for this because I really do feel like the, the concern of anger and the way this passage talks about it can lead to a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of misapplication about what God is wanting. So let's talk about this picture here for a moment, that we would be angry and do not sin. One of the things that I hope would come to our mind, if you drop your eyes down to verse 31, we'll get to that verse in a couple of weeks, Lord willing, but I want you to notice in verse 31, he says that I want all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and slander even away from you, along with all malice. So we're going to have to be careful about how we read, be angry and do not sin. And when just in a couple sentences later, he's going to put anger in the list of, I want these things completely removed from you. 
We have to be very careful here that as we read, be angry and do not sin, that we don't read that and go, well, therefore my anger is going to be absolutely okay. No, in four sentences he's going to say, no, it's not. So what does he mean by this when he speaks like this? Well, let's, let's start breaking that idea down. First of all, I think it's important that we just recognize that as human beings, all of us have emotions, and our emotions are God-given emotions. Feelings were made. God made us to have feelings. He didn't make us robots. You know, we're just, you know, we're completely impervious to everything. We have happiness, sadness, and, and, and anger is one of those God-given emotions. We have to accept that. That's something that has been put ultimately within us by God. And I think as you think about that, there are times where we certainly recognize that we ought to be angry. We're angry when we see an innocent person harmed uh, by a wicked person. We get angry when we see murder and school shootings, abuse, injustice. There are things that you see where we rightly have within us something that says, that's not right. I'm angry about that. I'm upset about that. But that's not good. In fact, I think it's useful to consider, you might remember that when we went through Exodus to Deuteronomy, we were told on a number of occasions, Moses was angry at the people of Israel because they're sinning over and over and over again. It says he was angry at them. I don't think that was a condemnation for what that's pointing out. That there is a point where there ought to be anger at sin, injustice, and wrong, and we naturally have that. But the issue that often comes up is that because we recognize that there are times when anger can be appropriate, we then justify all anger feelings that we always have as must be right. Well, I have a God and I give an emotion of anger, therefore any time I feel that emotion, it must be right. And I want to submit to you that probably the vast majority of times when we feel anger, it's coming from a place of selfishness. It's not coming from a place of, this is a massive injustice, and, and this is a huge sin, and I'm very upset about that, that that is happening. It's not the typical thing. And what we can have a tendency to do in reading about be angry and do not sin is lump the two together. The times when we are right to be angry, and then the vast majority of the times when we're wrong to be angry, throw them together and say, well, it's okay because it says be angry and do not sin. And I don't believe that's what the scriptures are teaching us at all. And I think we can prove that in uh, quite a few ways. Can you think of any times in your life, and I hope you can, and I'm not all by myself on this. Can you think of any times in your life where you were angry about something that was absolutely trivial? I think of like, I'm working on the car, and I drop the little screw, and it doesn't go all the way through. It lands on some thing in there. Now, now it's absolutely impossible to get in there, and oh, it's going to take another hour trying to figure out. It's a trivial thing. There's no way I can read that and go, now that is a, a justified anger, because this is a greater than justice that happened with this great No, it's just me being dumb. It's trivial. There's so many things that happen where we get angry because it's a place of selfishness. It's not a right uh, feeling. And I think that's what I want us to recognize, is just because we have a God-given emotion does not mean that it's been trained properly to be used every time. And sometimes we can fall into that trap. We just go, well, I feel angry, so that's okay. Not necessarily. And I can prove that with Scripture. Here's one of the, the great scenes. I want to go back to Jonah and preach this. It's been a long time since I preached Jonah. <laughs> the, the dialogue between God and Jonah is absolutely amazing. Now, to set a little bit of background, you might remember Jonah is sent by God as a prophet to the nation of Assyria. In particular, the capital is Nineveh, so that they would repent. Now, Jonah doesn't want to go because he doesn't want to see them repent because the city is worthy of judgment. 
And he's right. The city is worthy of judgment for its sins, but he doesn't love them to be spared the wrath that should come for sin. And so this leads to a whole back and forth between God and Jonah. And when at the end of chapter 3, you have a whole city of Nineveh repenting, the response of Jonah is it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Now, look at what God says. And God comes to him and says, well, since you have this God-given emotion of anger, let's be okay. No, he says, you're right to be angry. Of course, the implication is no. Your feeling of anger, Jonah, is wrong. You're angry, Jonah, but are you right to be angry? Was that the right response? Do you have the right feeling at this moment? And it happens again. You might remember that in just a few sentences later, we're told that Jonah leaves the city. He decides to sit outside of the city walls, and he finds a wonderful plank to sit under on a very hot day, and it's giving him some great shade, and God decides to make the next day really, really hot, and a huge scorching wind comes up and kills the plank. Here's Jonah's response. Jonah says to God, he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than live. Remember God's answer? Is it right for you to be angry about the planet? And Jonah says, yes. <coughs> yes, it is. I am so angry enough that I could die. Now, before we get too pointed about Jonah, you ever have that in your life where you're angry about something really trivial and dumb like that, and your spouse or your friend or somebody comes up to you and says, are you right to be angry? And you want to say, yes, yes I am. I am absolutely right to be angry. And we're very different from Jonah. <laughs> now, you become all the more upset that somebody pointed out to you, you should be angry about this trivial. Well, how dare you point out that I ought not to be angry? <laughs> it's the human condition. <laughs> These are the old clothes. These are the old clothes. So I want us to think about this very picture that is given to us that we would recognize as a first warning that not all anger is right. And we can prove that with God's discussion with Jonah. Are you right to be angry, Jonah? No. No, you're not. You shouldn't be angry about this, especially about the planet. The planet died. And he says, I'm angry enough to die. Over a planet? Over dropping a piece of metal in your car? Over some trivial thing that is happening to you in that very moment? In our minds and in our hearts, we think yes when the answer is no. It is not a right response. It is not that our souls, our spirits have been properly trained at all. And so we must stop and realize that just because I have that feeling, just because I have that emotion, does not necessarily mean it is right. It does not mean that that has been trained properly. But let's push forward with that and consider that even in the times when we can point out that our anger is right, notice the Apostle Paul says, do not sin. So we already first began with a lot of our anger is selfish. That's already wrong right there. Put that in the box over here. Wrong. And X on that. But there are times when anger is right, and he still says, don't sin. Does not justification to do whatever we want to do, which typically, what do we want to do? Vent the anger. We have a, a, a culture right now, a modern psychology that has told us for a very long time, it is really bad for you to bottle up your anger. Where did God, our creator, tell us that? God said, 
Uh, we're told you need to let it out. It's going to tear you up on the inside. It's going to be really bad. And so you've got to vent all that anger out. Where did God ever say that? It's also interesting. It's like Paul just now saying, actually, that's not true. Yeah, I know, because God didn't say that. That's why that's not true. I didn't need you. Thank you. But of course, we continue to perpetuate the lie that, oh, you need to vent all that anger. Anytime you feel anger, you just better let people have it. Because if you don't let them have it, what's going to really tear you up on the inside? God never said that. God never said that. And what I hope that we will recognize in that is in the rest of the verse that he gives here in verse 26 to 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. I'm supposed to see that these moments of anger are opening the door for temptation. It's an opening of the door to a sinful response. And I think that is a very important consideration that's given to us. Is that anger is getting the chance for the devil to tempt us to a wrong response. So we're in this part where anger is acceptable. But do not sin, because even in times when you might be able to say the anger is correct, Satan can still tempt you to have the wrong response, to still have the wrong answer. And I think it's important that we then become very honest about our anger. Because if you're like me, here's what I like, what I like to do. I'm not angry, I'm just upset. I'm not angry, I'm frustrated. I'm not angry, I'm disappointed. I'm not angry, I will give some other kind of declaration about what I think it really is. I'm not really angry, I'm just something else. And we need to be honest. We're angry. That's what it is. You can break out the thesaurus all you want to. But at the end of the day, we're being angry. And when we truly think about it, our sinful anger just truly comes from thinking about self. And that's usually what gives the venting of the anger. I was sort of like, oh, you need to vent your anger. Well, that comes from selfishness. Because that's what we want to do. We want other people to feel our pain. We want other people to be afraid. We want other people to never do whatever they did again, and so I will make them bear the punishment of whatever I can possibly drum up. And that's sinful. Absolutely sinful. Even if our anger is coming from a correct place, the idea of venting out our anger is wrong. It's sinful. Especially because what we're usually trying to do is be punitive. We're usually trying to harm them back for what they've done. For whatever they have done to us, whatever has happened to us that they've said or done, we vent it back out on them. And I hope that we would see that one of the reasons we need to stop wearing angry clothes, that the reason he gives here in verse 27, is because... When we are angry, we are making a very large space for the devil to come in and tempt us. We're just opening the door, saying, hey, Satan, come on in and make a mess because we're angry. That's what he's worrying about here. In fact, if you think about it, isn't it interesting that God doesn't do this with other emotions? Be sad and do not sin. Be happy and do not sin. Why does he do be angry and do not sin? Except because it's the most likely time you will sin. You are very, very vulnerable to reacting and responding in a sinful way. And that's why the warning is here versus other emotions, which certainly are true. Be sad, don't sin. Be happy, don't sin. But why have to express this one? Because this one is very dangerous. 
When we have the feeling of anger, we should immediately realize how dangerous of a situation we are in at that moment. That's what he's warning us. We are in a very dangerous spot. We are opening the door to Satan, who is now going to tempt us to say something, do something, react, or respond in a way that we ought not as the people. God. That's the big warning that has been given to us here. And so as we think about how are we going to get these angry clothes off of us and move toward the righteous clothes that God wants us to wear, I want us to think about what does the right response to right anger look like. I'm hoping I put in the box <laughs> Wrong anger is wrong anger, and probably somewhere in the 90 percentile, that's where our anger usually sits. That's already, that's verse 31. Get rid of that. We'll talk about that. Right out of that, that just needs to go. Oh, that trivial stuff, being angry, trivial, that, that. Wrong anger. Do you have a right to be angry? No, you don't. But when there is right anger, what is supposed to be the right response? I want you to notice verse 26. <laughs> be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Can I put this another way? I think the idea is this. If something is bothering you or something has happened, you are immediately supposed to try to reconcile that. If you have a reason for right anger, then it is your goal to try to resolve that as soon as possible. Immediately. Don't let time go by. And again, it's opening the door to the devil. Don't let that happen. So if there is right anger, immediately handle it with an attempt at reconciliation. Not venting anger, not being punitive, not being loud, not outburst, not threatening, not scary, not those reconciliation. Try to resolve what has happened in that moment. Do not let the sun go down all that anger, and so we do not handle it sinfully, but calmly, carefully, clearly try to solve the problem, try to seek reconciliation. But I hope you see what this means. The Lord just likes to see this. It means you have control over your anger. Be angry and do not sin. And don't let the sun go down on your anger. That whole sentence says you have complete control. You have complete control. We must banish from our language. I'm so angry because you made me. That's a lie. It's a complete deception and falsehood and lie. You have complete control. You have absolute control. My favorite illustration of this is you can be in your fit of rage, you're completely angry, and the phone rings, and oh, hi, how are you doing? Here, <laughs> you have control the whole time. That interruption proved it to you. You were losing it because you wanted to lose it. And you have control over that. God is not commanding us something that we cannot do here. We have complete control over that moment. And so God is warning us about this danger because you do have control, and we like to think that we don't have control. You made me do this. You made me act like that. It's because of you, and so I am excused for my anger because of you. And that's not true. And that's especially not true even if the anger is right. You still have control. 
be angry and do not sin. Even if you have gone through the process, you say, well, this, this was a huge, gross sin. What you do with it still matters. And you have control over that moment. And so we must quickly handle our anger so that we do not sin immediate reconciliation, so that we are not hurting others, saying things that we ought not say, or doing things that we ought not do, or building up bitterness and things like that that so often happen with anger that is not dealt with, immediately, immediately, immediately go to that person. And if we are truthful, and you think about what we just looked at in verse 25, if you've done something to somebody that has hurt them or angered them, a right anger, don't you want to know about that immediately? I mean, as the people of God, that would be something we just want to know. So that I can rectify that. So I can repent of it. So that I can resolve it. We want to be able to fix it. Wouldn't you want that consideration given to you? If you said something and you got taken the wrong way, or we were just being dumb human beings and said something we shouldn't have said, or did something we shouldn't have done, somebody would just be willing to come right to you and say, I heard. I wasn't fair. I wasn't right. But we want that. That's what will sustain relationships. That's what will sustain relationships in marriage and friendships at work in the church. Is that immediate reconciliation. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Let's end then talking about how we can put off these angry clothes. Some steps that we can take. Number one, when we feel anger, First step, ask yourself, are you right to be angry? Let God's words to Jonah just immediately hit you in the face. As soon as that emotion comes right in, just ask yourself, is this right? And, and don't answer like Jonah, yes, I'm right to be angry. Really do. Stop and really consider for a moment. Is this right? Or is this just selfishness? Is the reason I'm angry just pure selfishness? I just didn't like what somebody said. I just didn't like what somebody did. I didn't like what this inanimate object just did. Whatever it is, ask yourself, is it truly this sin that is against you, that is of wrong, or is it just selfishness? I just didn't like it. Number two. If you are right to be angry, if we've cleared the first one, if you say yes, then what can you do to resolve it not escalate? What can you do to resolve it not escalate? We have a fine way of escalating things. We just do. We have a fine way of just taking the situation, sticking a fuse in it, and writing it. Don't escalate the situation all the more just because you have cleared the first hurdle and said, my anger is right. Okay, I'm right. Hey, I'm going to get you because I'm right. Are you going to escalate it now? That's simple. What can we do to resolve it? What can we do to fix the situation now? That is the second thing that goes through our mind. What can we do to solve this? And then third, carry it out. Carry it out. If my anger is right, and now I'm not going to escalate the situation, and I consider what can I do to resolve this problem, then be the peacemaker. Carry it out. Do what will make for peace. Look to fix the problem. Our goal in reconciliation is to not let the other person know how wrong they are. Our goal in reconciliation is not to communicate to them what a terrible person they are for what they've done. We like to weave that in, right? <laughs> I'm right. You are wrong. You are terrible because of that. It is. We're so great. Really run that emotion.
emotion through those three lenses. In that way, we will be able to be angry and do not sin. To truly have anger when it is appropriate and then handle it in an appropriate way so that we give no room for the devil. Let me give the best illustration of all. Remember that we were told back in verse 24 that we are putting on these new clothes because they are created in the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. We are looking to be in the image of God. So let me just ask a couple of questions. Number one, does God have a right to be angry with you? No, he does. He absolutely does. He's right to be angry. What does he do about it? He fixes the problem. We're going to be in the image of God. We're going to put on these new clothes. Stop destroying relationships. And be what God has called us to be. And I'm right to be angry. And then I will look for reconciliation. Solve the problem. Do it in a way that represents Christ. Because he has every right to be angry with you. And rather than being angry with you, he died. Our Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, this 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 teaching, Lord, from your book is so challenging. And Lord, this emotion of anger can truly be such a difficulty. It can get the best of us in so many ways and so many times. Lord, I pray for us first for forgiveness for the times where we have used our anger as a weapon against other people. Forgive us, Lord, for having selfish anger. Forgive us for having an anger because we want to inflict pain and hurt on other people. Forgive us for taking out our pains and offenses and hurts on Lord, we pray for wisdom, wisdom that we would be able to analyze our emotions when anger arises, and that we could clearly see if this is a right anger or not. Help us to see when our anger is selfish, Lord, and just help us to put it away. Lord, help us to stop thinking about ourselves, stop being concerned about the things that happen to us, Lord, help us to be sacrificing Lord, when the anger is correct, help us to be reconcilers. Help us to not be vengeful. Help us to not take it out on other people. Help us, Lord, to be like you. So that we would seek to have reconciliation with people who hurt us. With people who sin against us. Lord, thank you for your love for us and the example of how you treat us. We are deserving of your wrath, Lord. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for not venting it out on us as we deserve. And thank you for your son that makes it possible to be reconciled. Forgive us, Lord, for our grave failures with our anger. Pray that we would be far more mature in the days ahead to react and respond just as your son would in such circumstances. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll sing an invitation song now. We do invite you to come to Jesus. And I hope you will think about.